Hi, welcome back to another session of our webinar by Beating Hearts. Uh, we are doing this in conjunction with, uh, in collaboration with the, uh, with Beacon Hospital. Uh, I hope uh, you can unmute yourself when you come in because the sound can be very distracting. I'm Dr. Betty Tay and I have here with me Dr. Ong, who is an ophthalmologist in Beacon Hospital. He actually um, is an oculoplastic surgeon. Uh, this is actually the first time I'm hearing that term, Ong. <laughs> uh, I always thought that all plastic surgeries were done by plastic surgeons. Um, and I think it's such a great idea that I am in mean, the confidence in the ophthalmologist doing plastic surgery on the eye uh, is actually much higher, I would say, because you have so much experience with anything I. So uh, without further ado, let us just uh, share your slides and then we will go ahead with your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Betty, for organizing this uh, sort of lecture. So let me share screen. Okay. Um, sorry. Right. Okay. So I've got the screen on and shall I start, Dr. Betty? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Just call me Betty, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you for you know, drawing out your evening, you know, 9 p.m., you know, and thank you for attending, all of you. So we have so far 26 participants. And I really is, I feel honored to be given this opportunity to share what I do on my on my day-to-day -day job. Obviously, as an ophthalmologist. You know, we do deal with lots of general things like cataracts, you know, glaucoma, diabetic eye disease. But uh, increasingly, especially in the Klang Valley, you know, uh, and certainly in Western countries, we are seeing subspecialism in certain aspect of the eye. So my particular okay. 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 Uh, yeah, you classic surgery. sorry, yeah, because um, I need to unmute some people. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Thank you, thank you. So uh, obviously in ocular plastic, some people, you know, some of my colleagues and sort of friends venture into cosmetic eyelid surgery, you know, uh, eyelid surgery in general. Some people deal with the orbit, you know, like trauma, you know, reconstructing the sort of bony structure of the eye. And I sort of particularly like tear duct operation. So even within ocular plastic, there are lacrimal, which is dealing with the tear ducts, and there are orbital and, and also the aesthetic part of ocular plastic. So it's getting really, really subspecialized. So today, you know, it's going to be an overview, right? So I don't expect you guys to remember everything. So at the end of this talk, yeah, you're going to get my phone number. So if any one of you have troubles, you can call me up, all right? I'm okay. My phone number is given to everybody, including all my patients and relatives. So you, yeah, I don't mind people phoning me up or sending me messages. Anyone can become a profitable trader. Sorry, again, I hope that you all can really, really unmute yourself when you come in. Because there's... Okay. Sorry? Sorry? Okay, go on. I go on. Because so, uh, you see, um, there is a lag in my thing. So uh, I'm... I can't see who is unmuted. Okay, let me just go through again. I'm so sorry, yeah. Uh, oh. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, when you come in, please unmute yourself so that there will be no disruption to our our talk. Okay. Okay, go on. Okay, I'll, I'll just continue. Yeah. I've got a lot of slides, you know, so I better move on. <laughs> yes, go on. Maybe photograph. So hopefully you get a pictorial memory and doesn't have to remember every text. So basically the, form, the sort of problems that people see on the day-to-day, -day, you know, uh, be it your general practitioners or any specialist, you get people coming in with droopy eyelids, lumps and bumps on their eyelids, swollen eyelids, or eyelid that is retracted, or even floppy eyelids, twitching eyelids and immobile lids, and also the traumatized eyelids. So let's start with the very basic anatomy and physiology talking about the form and function. So just to wake you guys up, you know, I'm going to show you some interesting photographs. But, you know, people ask me, is eyelid any important? Why do we need eyelids? Now, you know, it is 
by far. You know, people regard eyes and the eyelids as a beauty feature. You know, ladies will probably know that. You know, they put makeup on the eyelids and they do cosmetic surgery to it. And it's also a form of non-verbal communication, right? In the days of pandemic, when everybody is masked up, so we only can communicate with our voice and our eyes. So it's very important now. And on the more sort of uh, medical note, the eye offers protection to the eye surface from bright light, drying out, physical injury and infection. And not to forget, the eyelid actually nourishes the eye by uh, providing uh, lubrication, gases exchange and also immune function to protect the eye. So let's start with a photograph, all right? This is a classic to the advert. Uh, you know, the company put a lovely model just to get your attention. She's now, not a model. She's a very famous movie star. I know. <laughs> She's no. Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> She's right. very, very beautiful. Okay, go on. <laughs> uh, to illustrate where our attention goes to. I know you guys will be looking somewhere else, you know, but basically, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how people look at certain uh, sort of adverts and they found out that the heat maps is really concentrated on the eyes and the <laughs> area, all right? So this is based on obviously men and women, so the viewers, so that's what they get on average. So the eyes is very important in drawing people's attention. So you see people pay less attention on the product, more on the eyes. So the eyes is very important. So let's talk about eye protection. Blinking is very fundamental in the eye protection. So it is a spontaneous, voluntary, and it's a reflex sort of a reaction. And it happens within 300 milliseconds, actually very, very fast. And we typically blink about you know, 12 blinks per minute. And we blink less if you're looking at digital screen or you're reading something intently. So that's the reason why people who use a lot of digital screens get really dry eyes because of lack of blinking. Now, this is a video of somebody's eye and the blinking effect. So I put some fluorescent dye on the eye and you can see as it blinks, you can see a layer of liquid protecting the surface of the eye. So this is called the tear film and it sits on the surface and it maintains the moisture of the eye. Right, so I'm gonna go back to the eyelid anatomy. So the eyelid anatomy, some trivia, if you want to sort of play games with your colleagues, you know, over the dinner table, you can ask about some trivia. So the thinnest part, uh, thinnest skin in the body happens to be around the eyelids and there are many layers and they are rich in blood supply, nerve endings, and they're surrounded by muscles and they're packed with oil glands and they have their built-in tear drainage ducts. And interestingly, there are racial differences in the anatomy, right? So I will show you some differences in the anatomy itself from different races. So the blood supply is really rich, and I do expect you to remember all the branches, but the key point is they are anastomosis. So they are different uh, supply of blood vessels to the upper and the lower eyelids from different branch from the arteries. So basically there is no uh, sort of fear of ischemia or any sort of thrombosis on the eyelid blood vessels. Typically the anastomosis will supply an eyelid heals very well after surgery. And the muscles around the eye is quite strong, consisting of the opicularis that helps us to blink and to protect the surface of the eye. And also the nerve that comes in is pretty rich. Therefore, the eye is very, very sort of sensitive to any dust or any stimulants. Here, the it has a built-in drainage system. So basically, the eye actually has a built-in self-cleaning system. So the drainage ducts are like the the sewer, sewage pipes that drains away dirt, germs, bacteria, dust, whatever, into the sort of nasal passage. And the eyelid anatomy, there are many layers consisting of the skin, of the calaris muscles, and then you have the tarsal plates, and there are obviously racial differences. They typically, sort of in Malaysia, we call people uh, oriental people, single versus double eyelid. So I'm a typical example with a single eyelid. So we have different anatomies. So the anatomy is on the insertion of the levator muscles, uh, giving rise to differences in the racial appearance. 
So uh, different races will have different anatomy and therefore, you know, doing surgical correction, we need to identify the types of uh, uh, differences. And let's go into some pathology now, you know, talking about the droopy eyelids. So we're talking about congenital things uh, and acquired. So congenital ptosis uh, usually you know, cause, uh, will cause lazy eye or in sort of medical speak, amblyopia due to deprivation and during the development of the eye. And sometimes it may also cause a squint as a child as is developing with the uh, droopy eyelids, they may get eyes not able to see and the eyes couldn't form a correct alignment. So congenital ptosis needs to be corrected if it's causing amblyopia or squint. Now, as an adult, most people acquire so the ptosis because of contact lens wear. So young people wearing contact lens over a prolonged time, they will get two ptosis. And most commonly patients I see in the clinic are those with aging and also cataract surgery as this is caused by our speculum stretching the eyelid and that could induce a ptosis. Obviously there are other causes like trauma and to the neurological deficits. So this is a classic example of congenital ptosis. So the picture on your left is a patient before the surgery and typically these people, a patient comes in with a very droopy eyelids and you can see the brow is very high. Uh, the patient is using the frontalis muscle to really compensate the droopy eyelids. Now the surgery is done uh, usually with slings, silicone slings to pull the eye up. And as you observe this young person, you can see the eye is not quite looking straight. At you. Uh, the left eye, is looking slightly on the outside. So he has got a bit of an exotropia and that is caused by the congenital ptosis leading to the left eye not seen as well. So this is another uh, example of a congenital ptosis. So the patient comes in and with bilateral symmetrical ptosis and in interfering with the job. So with surgery, you know, with a silicone sling, uh, we can just sort of lift the eyelid. So this patient obviously comes in with an aging related uh, ptosis. Now it is very subtle, you know, most people couldn't see any significant ptosis. Uh, this patient comes in uh, obviously mainly to correct the droopiness on the outer eyelid, mainly of the cosmetic and a bit of a functional sort of uh, indications. So as you can see, when you repair it, also you will find that the eyelash is turning out a little bit more. So it actually gives a patient a better feel of you when you do this sort of surgery. I see. That's amazing. <laughs> I thought she, she did something. I thought she, she did mas mascara to her face. Uh, I eyelashes. mascara as well. <laughs> I think she probably put as a mascara and eyeshadow as well. It's so obvious, the, the, the eyelashes now after the surgery. So this is an interesting patient. There will be a video, okay? He came in with a droopy eyelid. And interestingly, his droopiness is very variable. So when you look at him like that, you notice his right eye, right? Right eye, the brow is really high up. You know, he's like very surprised look on one side and the left eye seems to be okay. And that is a sign that he's using his frontalis muscle to compensate. So because of the variability in the ptosis, so I did an ice pack test, which we'll demonstrate for you. Just look straight at the camera for me. So this is before doing any eyes pack as you have Could a look. up for me, please. Right, struggle to look up and it's really, really fatigued. Okay, now we're going to look at the ice pack test, right? So the ice pack test, put some ice pack on his eye for 10 minutes. Really? Yeah, take it down. Okay. Okay. Then you can see, see his double eyelid. His double eyelid has started to appear. In the first me. photograph, he has no double eyelid. Just look straight at the camera for me. Yeah, so keep looking much better, better, much better, isn't it? Better, isn't it? <laughs> so a lot of people are chipping there. there, but the lid is more open. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how does this work? Yeah, this is basically myasthenia gravis is a very sort of crude and a simple sort of a bedside test. And what it does is actually relaxes the muscle, it cools down the muscle. So the neuromuscular junction has time to replenish, you know, the neurotransmitters. And then, and then you get a transient improvement in the droopiness. 
So uh, it's very simple, very cheap. You know, as a GP, you can do it. You know, if you find somebody with droopy lids or even double vision that comes and goes and is variable, then it, it helps to check it. You know, make sure they haven't got a myasthenia gravis. Uh, to confirm the diagnosis, you need to do blood tests or even uh, uh, electromyography to confirm it. But this is a very quick uh, bedside test to identify sort of a neuromuscular junction cause of ptosis. Right, I'm gonna speed into lumpy eyelids. Uh, typically, you think about two things. Are they benign or the malignant? So benign thing by far is the most common uh, sort of uh, eyelid condition that we see. Malignant ones are very rare, but just bear in mind, if a sort of lesion doesn't go away, progressively getting worse, think about potential malignant lesions. So that's what we need to think about. So the benign ones are typically style, uh, uh, not style, is a, a typo that is style. <laughs> <laughs> it's not style. Calasian, which is the same stuff, or meibomian cyst, skin tags, or xanthelasma, or fatty deposit, and molds, right? And malignant ones that we typically see, especially in Malaysia, are like the basal cell carcinoma, uh, very rarely squamous cell carcinoma, and even more rare sebaceous cell carcinoma. And uh, in terms of uh, incident, melanoma is even more rare to see. You know, particularly in Malaysian, we are more pigmented, so we tend not to get much melanoma. Right, meibomian cyst is caused by a blocked oil duct, or what we call meibomian gland, leading to inflammation, infection, and it could be linked with a condition called rosacea, and just be aware that if you get somebody with recurrent or non-resolving calasin, it could be just you know, something else. It could be a, a tumor there. So just bear in mind, if you get a patient with recurrent problems, um, you might need a biopsy. So this is a typical patient coming in with a lump on the edge of the eyelids. Generally, how to treat them, you know, I would tell my patient to uh, ask them to apply some hot compress about two to five minutes twice a day and gently just massage it. Yeah, about 50% of the time, they will just disappear without any further treatment. Occasionally, you need to do surgery to you know, drain those uh, cysts to encourage the healing process. And some people say, is it worthwhile putting ointments, creams? Generally, it doesn't work, right? Uh, because it doesn't penetrate deep into the skin. So if you flip the eyelid, that is exactly what you see. Under the eyelid, you can see red inflamed tarsal plates and little oil glands that's oozing out, you know, uh, I think I've got a mouse to show. Okay, anyway. So generally hot compress will be my first line. And if it doesn't work, then you think about a simple a minor operation. So these are the, all the blocked up glands. Uh, this patient comes in with recurrent bilateral meibomian cyst. And you can see the tip of the nose. She's got all these rashes going out around. And that is uh, sort of, a rosacea, which is predisposing this condition. Um, if it's infected uh, with pus inside, then obviously this will require antibiotic treatment. Normally I'll give them oral antibiotics and surgery to drain the pus. Right, skin tags, uh, so the technical term is hydroepithelioma. It's very common and usually they're like, you know, fleshy, flesh-colored lesion, uh, pedunculated, they're very benign, usually linked with people with diabetes and obesity. And the treatment of choice is to shave it and to cauterize the base and generally do pretty well. As you can see, the gentleman comes in with a lot of skin tags. So it's a pretty laborious process to remove every one of them. So the big ones, I just literally snip it off with a tiny sort of uh, scissors and the small one just literally cauterize it. So that's what happens after the operation. And he heals pretty well, you know, in about sort of one month's time. Or there are hardly any scars, and you know, particularly eyelids. You know, if you do very, very superficial cuts, they do heal very well with those scars. Then the last one, which is kind of a fatty uh, sort of inflammatory deposits, usually associated with hypercholesteremia. And well, maybe Dr. Betty will tell me, <laughs> is it a independent risk factor for ischemic heart disease and death? <laughs> Definitely an independent risk factor. <laughs> so, people come and see me purely for cosmetic reasons. They want to get rid of it. Uh, this patient comes along and complains about that lumps. 
Uh, it doesn't harm the eye, but it's mainly a cosmetic thing. Uh, you can remove it if they are small. Typically, we just excise it, but I will warn them, you know, they may come back. Again. So it's not going to be a permanent solution. So they may get a recurrence. So, okay, move on. Malignant tumors. I think the most important one to, to look for is the basal cell carcinoma. And uh, they're usually slow growing, painless, and is a malignant skin cancer. And I do see a lot of these patients in the, in the West when I was working in the UK. Um, you usually see people every week, you know, coming with malignant eyelid tumors. So this is a patient I saw in the UK. She came in with a lung, which is painless, you know, not boring her. It's been there for years, but it's getting bigger. So she came in and we biopsy and was proven to be malignant. Now to excise it, we have to excise some clear margin, you know, not just the lump that you see with the naked eye, we need about three millimeter on both sides. So after this excision, she pretty much lost more than half the eyelid. So, so my job is to come and fix eyelids. So I have to uh, borrow some skin and tarsal plate from the upper lid and bring it down. And you can see their scars on the upper eyelid, uh, pretty much took some skin and patch at the bottom eyelid with a free skin graft. So after the surgery, you can see there is a bridging tissues from the upper and the lower lid, uh, literally taking some skin from the upper lid to bridge the gap at the bottom. And after a few weeks, about six weeks, when the new skin has healed, we just divide that bridging skin. So at the end of the reconstruction, that's about, you know, maybe about three months after the uh, surgery, then you can see that she's got a new eyelid. Obviously, it doesn't look the same as the previous original one, but you know, at least it's a functional eyelid. So in the UK, we get people coming with the early basal cell carcinoma, but obviously in Malaysia, we do have a different uh, group of people. So this patient came in and, you know, an elderly gentleman with a pigmented ones. So typically in Malaysian, you know, we do get pigmented basal cell carcinoma. And this is not melanoma, it's basal cell carcinoma. Because of the extensive nature, we have to, you know, do a most a micrographic surgery, which means we remove a layer of skin on the margin, and a look at the microscope to make sure it's clear before we stop the operation. This was done in a university setting in conjunction with a dermatologist. So at the end of the operation, he lost almost all the eyelid. <laughs> oh, you including the upper eyelid. <laughs> So is that how extensive the tumor is. It's got deeper extension. So he has lost the entire lower lid and the, almost the, you know, maybe about one fifth of the upper eyelid. So at the end of the day, I had to find ways to reconstruct. So now the eyelid was closed completely because I had to borrow some upper lid skin and bridge it at the bottom. And at the end, we managed to fix it. That is about three months after surgery. Interesting, with just one surgery, you know, I try to re reconstruct. Now you can see the redness at the bottom lid is because of the healing. You know, I offer to do more surgery to improve the cosmet cosmesis. But I think from, for, from this patient, he say, I'm quite happy. You know, I can close my eye at night. I'm okay. So he just uh, prefer to be left like that. Uh, so that even the largest defect can be repaired. And you can see there are some stretch marks around the corner of the eyelid because I managed to pull some skin from the, you know, the side of the eyelid to patch the area. All right, so okay, back to solar eyelids. So mainly they are infection, inflammation, and cancer that can lead to swollen eyelids. All right, so this patient is a very sort of severe spectrum. He's got necrotizing fasciitis, very rare, but devastating and potentially life-threatening. And, uh, he, had, he has uncontrollable diabetes and he started with a little lumps and bumps on the eyelid and he just left it and it just spread. So pretty much have to pump him with huge amount of intravenous antibiotics. Now, the interesting thing to learn about is a lot of people said, you know, oh, eyelid is so bad, we need to do massive debridement, you know, but eyelid has got rich blood supply. I tend not to debride the eyelids, even though there are some sort of necrotic parts of the eyelid, I tend to generally leave them alone. So just uh, basically to let him alone and he recovered pretty well. I haven't got one post-op photograph, but he recovered pretty well after this uh, treatment. Now, I'm going to show, tell you about uh, active thyroid eye disease. Now, active thyroid eye disease is, is sort of emergency, is an ocular emergency. 
So this patient comes in, uh, when you look at the eye, uh, it doesn't immediately give you the danger sign of thyroid eye disease, you know, oh, okay, the eye is not particularly proptosed, but the eye is red. You can see their redness, what we call chemosis. Now, interestingly, when you look at the pupil, her pupil is a bit sluggish, a bit dilated. Now, this is uh, that sort of active thyroid eye disease compromising the optic nerve. So this is pretty much an ocular emergency, including this patient who comes in and there's not a lot of proptosis, but she's got optic nerve compromise. So this lady also has pre edema, uh, which is caused by Graves' disease. Now, this patient comes in with a lump on the eyelid, and the lump is quite swollen, and it is pretty rubbery in the texture. So I did a biopsy of, of this patient, and he came back to be a lymphoma. So I've seen quite a few patients like that recently. Um, so we've got to watch out for lymphoma presenting uh, first on the eyelid. So this is the second patient that came in with a massive lump on the eyelid. I biopsy him and it came back to be another lymphoma as well. So lymphoma patient, generally I send them to hematologist for treatment. I don't do excision or sort of white excision of the tumor because you know, with chemotherapy or steroid, they generally do very well. They will literally melt away. Sometimes radiotherapy will just melt them completely. So I will go straight into retracted eyelids, uh, talking about tight muscles and tight skin, and also thyroid eye disease again, particularly those affecting the eyelids. So this patient came in and he has sort of burnt out thyroid eye disease. So you can see his eye is not particularly red and there is less swelling around the eye, but his eye looks very, very scary and the eyelid is completely retracted and you can see a lot of white of the eye. So he's coming in mainly for the appearance. He works in sales and he's telling me, you know, whenever I look at my customers, you know, people would give me sort of funny looks because he looks sort of very scary. So he wanted something done to the eyelid. So we talk about ptosis correction. We can do surgery to lift the eyelid. Now this is kind of a, a reverse ptosis operation. We actually undermine the muscles to allow the eyelid to fall down a little bit. So this is exactly what I've done. I sort of, sort of dissected the levator muscles and the Muller's muscle to allow the eye to come down a little bit. So this is what happens after his operation. And that will also give him some comfort because the eye being exposed like that, he will feel a lot of dryness in the eye. Right now, okay, I'm gonna go into a floppy eyelid. Um, very few people have heard about floppy eyelids, but if you don't look for it, you will not see it, all right? Floppy eyelid is pretty common, usually linked with people who are a bit obese, and generally they snore quite a lot at night, and they have uh, episodes of sleep apnea. So these people tend to have very uh, sort of tired uh, sort of uh, sensation, and they have daytime sleepiness, and it can also affect the heart, right, of the back here again. <laughs> So I generally check these people out uh, in a clinic and by just lifting the eyelids. So if you find that by lifting the eyelid, the eyelid literally flops, uh, flip over, and that is a feature of sort of a floppy eyelid. And a lot of these patients come to see me with sticky red eyelids, and a lot of them also go to the GPs and being treated for conjunctivitis. And so it's quite uh, important if you see somebody with recurrent conjunctivitis or potential conjunctivitis that doesn't go away, doesn't respond to any treatment, just gently pull the eyelid. If you see the eyelid is really stretchy, you know, literally want to flip over without much effort, think about floppy eyelid. So the treatment is to protect the eye at night. Typically they sleep on one side and the side they sleep on will have the worst side of, uh, sort of problems. Generally get them to put a little pad to cover the eye when they sleep either get those airline sort of uh, sleep uh, iPad and to stop the eye from flipping over and putting some artificial tear eye drops. I avoid doing any eyelid tightening operation because the more you tighten it, the worse it's going to get. So, and bear in mind, think about sleep apnea. Ask about the sleeping pattern and if, you know, and maybe do an ECG and you know, send to Dr. Bethy for further assessment. <laughs> I'll check eyelids from now on. <laughs> yeah, if you see something pretty big, 
the red eyes and the, the white complaint that he snores all the time or like all this <laughs> check the eye of edema that is to, to do with the the collagen the elastic collagen elastin in the tissues Ooh. so that there are some genetic abnormality they are uh, elastin is very stretchy and it affects the airway so when they sleep the airway will literally collapse so these people need to be investigated by the uh, ENT physicians, cardiologists, and oh, usually come to the eye doctor first, or even the GP first, because usually these people will get lots of uh, conjunctivitis that it doesn't resolve. There you go, sticky eyelids, pussy eyelids, and they're all floppy eyelids. Okay, the twitching eyelids. So a lot of patients come and see me with twitching of the eyelids. Uh, we Usually when I see these people, I will find uh, other reasons for twitches in the eyelid, like dry eyes, allergies, and then sometimes, you know, check the other cranial nerves, make sure they haven't got other things going around. Uh, and if you're not sure, you do an MRI scan of the brain. If there's no other cause, then essentially we call this essential blepharospasm. We're not sure whether it's genetic, but we tend to see in people um, um, who are very anxious, you know, they may get a lot of this spasm. And obviously there are things that triggers it, like anxiety, stress, and some medication. Typically the treatment is botulinum toxin injection, or Botox injection. So these patients typically come in with twitching. Sometimes they come in with droopy eyelids, like this lady. She came in saying, her eyes always droopy, but the droopiness is not because of aging or any other reason. It's because of the spasm, the really, really tight muscle that she has that keeps uh, closing down. So after doing Botox injection or uh, botulinum toxin injection, then her eyelid will open up a little bit more. Uh, so this is what you can see some little bumps and lumps and bumps on the eyelid is after the Botox injection. So topping up the injection. So. So droopy eyelid is not just aging. Sometimes we think about other things, uh, the, the neuro, uh, neurological things about the eye. Okay, immobile eyelids. Okay, facial palsy is what we, I see quite a lot. Uh, you know, people come in with uh, Bell's palsy. Their eyes can close, the eye get exposed to the air, dryness in the cornea get exposed. And sometimes people may have shingles leading to you know, facial nerve palsy and brain tumor, etc. So now I'll show you some photographs. Um, okay. Let's see, one minute. I think the computer hang. <laughs> Lagging, is it? Lagging or hanging. Oh dear. Uh, oops, okay, okay, now we're moving up. Right, so this patient comes in with facial palsy. So, that's very important. If you see somebody like that, facial palsy, it's important to check inside the eye. So a lot of uh, my colleagues, and including, you know, in, particularly in the neurosurgeon, they say, oh, the eye is closing, it's fine. I'll you know, just leave them alone. But always check, you know, that the eye is okay. Because even though they are, eye almost appear to be closing, but in fact, it's just a fall of skin in front of the eye. Whatever is inside, uh, behind the fall of skin, Basically, it's an exposed eyelid. So he may appear like that, closing the eye, it looks okay, but if you flip his, uh, lift his eyelid away, and you can see the eyelid actually open under, behind the eyelids. So when I to check more carefully, he has got a corneal ulcer. Uh, this is sort of a neuropathic ulcers. The eye just couldn't close and dries up, and you get this ulceration in the eye. So it's important to do surgery to close the eye, so this is the surgery that we're going to do, tarsorophy. And I, I generally do sort of temporary tarsorophy with stitches. And I leave those stitches pretty long so that I can trim them at the end. And you can see the cornea heals up after you know, a couple of, uh, you know, about three or four days after tarsorophy. Right. Some people, they come in with uh, long-standing facial nerve palsy. And obviously, this young lady, you know, she came in. I offered her to do the tarsorophy, but she was giving, yeah, she's not having it. Because tarsorophy is quite disfiguring. You know, you can see the eye, you know, a little pinched. 
So we have another way of sorting out this uh, inability to close the eye is using gold eyelid weights. Okay, so let's, and there are a lot of pictures on this slide. So you start by looking at the top row, top row picture. So the patient starting with, so the top upper uh, left row, you can see her eyes not able to close. Her left eye is completely exposed. And then the middle photograph, the top middle, I put a little test weight. You know, it's basically a, a metal called tantalum. And you put it there, you stick it on the eyelid, and there are numbers on it. So you see the number is about 16, about 16 grams. Then you attach, then you get a fine balance. So you can see the middle row pictures with the weight. She's okay, you know, she's not getting too much of a droopy eyelid. And yet when she closes the eye, it's reasonable closure. So then I just go ahead and then implant this gold. So you can buy gold. This is like pure gold, medical grade and implant into the eyelid itself, just underneath the skin of the eyelid. Then when she closes the eye, she is able to close much more effectively. So the top eye, the top pictures, top left and the right top left, are top right. You can use a pointer. Just point scroll, you know, just scroll <laughs> it with a pointer. Can you see the pointer? I was trying to quit that. I think my pointer comes about. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No need to, no, don't need to go back. Present still, show your slide as a presentation. I don't know, I couldn't see it. My pointer wouldn't come out. I have yeah, to... yeah, yeah, no, the, 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 when you're scrolling, it's the pointer. Is it? Yes, I can see your your, your arrow thingy. Okay, now you can go see, back. I can't see my own arrow, but anyway. Um... Okay, play first. <laughs> play, okay. Yeah, press play. He's lag lagging as well. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. I mean, let me let me quit a few screen that is mm, lagging a bit. Okay. Oh, there the pointer is there. Pointer is coming out. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's pointer there. Okay. Press press play first. Press play. Baby. There's a bit of a lag. No, sorry about that. Um, where is the pointer? Okay, just press play first. Try to annotate. Let me go back. Go back. Okay. Okay. I think I'll play. I'll, I'll stop me fasting. Okay. And <laughs> can you see the pointer? No? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. I, the, yeah. My mouse doesn't seem to be working. Okay. I got annotate there. Okay. I'll probably get annotate. Ah, I never mind. Okay. Okay. We will. Okay. Okay. We will. Okay. Never mind. We will. My screen. <laughs> yeah, I know. We have so much to learn just by presenting. So yeah. Basically, you know, uh, and instead of making it this uh, disfiguring operation, you can put implant. So a go implant. So I did this lady, you know, uh, she is a government servant, you know, in the University of Malaya. So the go was paid for by the government, <laughs> by the taxpayers' <laughs> money. And a go is pretty good. Right now we have uh, platinum now, right? <laughs> wow. Platinum is even more expensive. <laughs> Platinum is even heavier than, not, not heavier, it's even denser than gold. So uh, for those people with uh, budget unlimited, I will give them yeah. platinum. Platinum has got a smaller footprint, a lot heavier, which means it doesn't give you this uh, sort of bulgy look on the eyelid when you close your eye. So gold and platinum, you know, it's available for this sort of implant. All right, I'll move on. Okay. so. I uh, better give you some disclaimer. Because we're dealing with traumatized eyelid, you're going to see some gory images. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll prepare so, so myself. Scary images. So this is uh, Certificate 18. <laughs> okay. I'm not allowed to watch this. So I'll start with trauma. Okay, right. Ooh. So this poor lady was involved in a domestic violence. Um, I think, I don't know what happened. I think the partner or the husband, I think both, just basically uh, got drunk and just beaten her up, right? So she was pretty badly traumatized. So, we, uh, you know, I don't see much in the prior practice, but, you know, when I was in the university practice, I do get this quite a lot, quite a lot. Uh, you get people coming in in the middle of the night with traumatized eyelid. But obviously, I won't tell you how we repair this, but the general thing is eyelid are very, very good at healing. And... Even though 
let's say in a nasty trauma, you know, somebody lost a piece of skin or lost a piece of eyelid. If they happen to be sitting on the roadside, you know, I'll pick it up, you know, bring it to me, I will patch it back for you. Uh, generally, eyelids, even though it's completely detached from the body, if you plug it in, they will, they will survive because of the rich blood supply. So do not debride, do not throw away any skin. They are pretty useful for repairing. So the second patient is sort of, a, is a very sad, you know, there was an explosion. He's uh, Indonesian, you know, he's a foreign worker. He works in a factory and there's some fire, a gas explosion. And the whole face got badly burnt. But you see, despite all the burns here, the eyelashes is still okay. And eyelids are still pretty good. And you know, he still has some pretty good eyelids. If you can see, there's some pigmented skin just around the eyelashes. Because the reflex of the eye when it bling is so rapid, the moment there's an explosion, we will really squeeze our eye really tight. So the eyelid skins tend to be preserved in the bad burns. Uh, the trouble is when you have burns around the eyelid, you do get scarring and it actually pulls the eyelid open. So this patient on the left eye, he just couldn't open, uh, close the eye properly. And that is the sort of patient that I need to see because there's a danger of the eye uh, getting to the dry out and getting problems. So, so you can see the two eyes are all scarred up, you know, because of chronic exposure and you get this bluish tinge to the cornea. Okay, sorry, it is pretty scary picture. <laughs> this, this girl is only eight years old and she went to the supermarket with the mum. And you know, like the supermarket, like Daiso, they have all these little metal hooks where they hang all the tiny little things. So she was in the shop, you know, trying to maybe running around and didn't notice there was a hook in a display counter. And then she just literally bent down and the hook just went straight oh. in and then hooked the eyelid out the way. So that is what happened to her. She came in and the key is you see the eye is still vascular. It's still rare and pink, even though it's hanging by a thread of tissue at the corner there. Literally the eye was hanging on the cheek when she came in. So, uh, so it's pretty red, it's still vascularized, even though it's hanging right at the, sort of maybe a few you know, millimeter of eyelid skin there. So don't throw that skin away, don't cut it away and fix it. So, but it's a complicated sort of a re repair because we had to repair the tear duct as well. So the first part of the surgery is to find the tear drainage ducts, the drainage pipes using a probe and look for it and try to find one end of the tear duct and find the other end and a thread a silicone sling inside and join the two ends together. The silicone sling goes into one end and then this is the tendon, the middle kind of tendon, secure the lid to the tendon and a lot of stitching, layers of muscles, tarsal plate and at the end you get all the skin stitched up and so you can reasonably repair it after the operation is like that, right? So you can put pretty much things back again. So I is pretty forgiving, you know, it's, you can pretty much stitch everything back again. This is the last slide. Have you got enough time? Well, we still have 15 minutes. Yeah, we do, we do. It's very interesting. So it basically it's going to give you a, a sort of an overview of, you know, what ocular plastic people like me do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, eyelid is pretty precious, you know, don't throw them away and they are, uh, useful things. So I think if for those of you who are completely sort of, wow, totally, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, this is like the repair. Uh, I think the take home message is my phone number. <laughs> <laughs> if, if there's any a GP out there who, who got a patient in front of you, you have no clue what's going on. You can give me a ring. All right. This number is not just uh, for you guys. Uh, the number is available on if you go to the NSR website, you will click my name, you might find my number there. <laughs> and it's on my name card, you know, I give to all my patients. So the good thing is people will call me if they've got emergency. Uh, but the downside is they will WhatsApp me a lot of greetings on Chinese New Year, on uh, Hari Raya. <laughs> <laughs> I literally get hundreds of greetings messages. So, but you know, it's okay. As long as, you know, some, anyone who has emergency, they can get hold of me. So that will be my last slide. And I think, are we allowed to take questions? Yeah, or? yeah, we'll take questions. 
Yeah, uh, it's been very, very interesting. Uh, I have never done ophthalmology before. Mm, so we will take questions. Are there any questions? Uh, okay, so we will need some time for them to actually... Okay. The, the process, there are a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You can ask me anything, right? If you are oh, yeah. trying to ask, you can always WhatsApp me. <laughs> Yes, uh, hold on. I forgot. I need to actually put up a slide. Uh, maybe you can take away your slide. Yeah, like stop sharing while we wait for them to ask questions. Um, okay, so hold on. Let me share my slides. Slide. I only have one slide actually. Where is my okay? Okay, so this is actually the QR code for the CPD point. Now you need to be on a laptop and then scan your QR code with your phone. You can't watch it over your phone and also try to scan it at the same time, it doesn't work. So um, there is a question by Dr. Lim. Are the retracted eyelids in the thyroid eye disease reversible without surgery if the condition is controlled? Yep, okay, uh, good question, yes. In a very mild form of lid retraction, once you control the thyroid, they will improve the mild ones. But once it's chronic and it's really retracted for a long time, they tend to get some fibrotic change in the muscles. So when that happens, then it is very, very tough to really uh, let, uh, to, to resolve. It won't resolve. In fact, a lot of patients who come to surgery, after the surgery, they retract back again. So I see a lot of patients, even after the first operation, they, you know, we undermine the levator upper muscles, they will retract back again. So it can be quite a, a frustrating operation. You've done a lot of surgery, they go back to the original again. So it can be quite tricky to maintain the eye being lower. So the answer is yes, in the early stage, if you treat it, they will recover. If it's in a chronic stage, you know, that lasted for more than six months, very unlikely they will sort of recover on its own. Can I ask, what is the pathophysiology behind this, uh, this eye problem with Graves' disease? Yeah, it's because of the autoantibodies that our the body produces. The autoantibody is mainly attacking the, uh, the thyroid gland, but they have, they have a cross uh, reactivity to the muscle. There are receptors around the muscles of the eye that will be attacked by these antibodies. So it's interesting, you know, when they attack the eye, the eye will have the similar sort of reaction. It's basically acute inflammatory response. You get swelling, you have heat, redness, and you get sort of increased uh, vascularization, and the sequelae is going to be fibrosis. So it's a typical uh, sort of uh, acute inflammatory response. And also, it will affect the eyelid muscles, soft tissues, uh, mainly on the extraocular muscles. So that's, and very interestingly, when the disease in the eye has sort of progressed, it has a mind of its own. So when the thyroid eye disease starts to sort of progress, even though you control the thyroid function very, very well, the eye disease seems to continue on its own course. So it's you know, interesting, you know, when it first started with a similar trigger, but when it's triggered, it will have its own, uh, own uh, sort, of oh. cold, sort of disease process. Generally, it will last for about 18 months. From the beginning, you have the sort of increasing phase, plateau, and then you will recovery phase. So the treatment is to give them immunosuppression to really sort of dampen the immune system so that they won't get all the complications from thyroid eye disease like the fibrotic change, like the magic squints, the optic nerve compromise, things like that. Okay, Monisha asked, 
What is the treatment for conjunctivitis in infants? Is it common to have conjunctivitis in infants? Conjunctivitis, um, we, we do get them. You know, when you see infants that get conjunctivitis, uh, you need to find out whether it's a bacterial or the viral. Viral one is quite common. Generally, don't need to do anything. So not even antibiotics. So when I see a viral conjunctivitis, I would just give them artificial teardrops. In fact, you don't need to give them anything, right? But patients do expect some drops, you know? So I'll give them some soothing eye drops. I generally avoid prolonged use of antibiotics. You can use antibiotics like cremphenicol, but don't use it more than seven days. Um, and if the eye doesn't get any better, don't change antibiotics, don't give anything else. Uh, bacterial conjunctivitis tend to be presenting with a lot of sticky eyelids, a lot of discharge, and you generally see the eyelashes are all stuck together, very matted. If you see a lot of sort of crust, sticky, sort of yellowish discharge, then you give antibiotics straight away. If you possibly can, you swab it first. And normally, people come in with just red eyes, a lot of watering, you know, you can see the eyes red, very shiny. They are usually viral in origin, tend to happen in one eye, you know, a few days later, we we'll get on the other side and they are very contagious. Generally, you know, treat them like uh, sort, of, uh, sort of supportive care. So that's conjunctivitis. Recurrent ones, you need to look for other causes to make sure there are no eyelashes yeah, in the eye. Children, you know, in an infant age, particularly uh, sort of uh, uh, so oriental children, they have lashes that might go in the eye, what we call epiblepharon that will rub against the eye. So make sure they haven't got eyelashes in there because treatment is not just treating the conjunctivitis, you need to treat the eyelashes as well. Um, okay, um, Serena asked for exophthalmos, when would the eyelid surgery be done? Wait for the control of thyroid disorder first? So first step, you know, is when the patient comes into your clinic, you need to know, are they in the active phase of the disease process or they are in the recovery phase of the disease process? So generally, you need to see them maybe two or three times to find out whether they are in the sort of active disease phase. So we do have a scoring system, you know, clinical activity score. You know, we look at basically acute inflammatory markers, just basically clinical ones. You look at eyelid swelling, any eyelid redness, and you are you ask about pain symptoms, especially at rest and when they move the eyes. And you look at the eyes, are they red? You know, are they puffy? And so these are all the scoring. If they score for you know three symptoms or more, then they will need some some form of steroids. Generally, people give them oral penicillin. Generally, if they're very bad, about points, four points and above, I'll give them intravenous uh, pulse IV metoprednisolone. Uh, just to maintain uh, sort of immunosuppression. And when their condition is stable for six months or more, then we say they are sort of stable. If they are not having any further redness or any worsening for six months, then you can do surgery to the eyelids. And some people, they have really bulgy eyes. They don't like it or they feel discomfort. They are surgery to decompress, which may be remove the sort of bones around the socket to allow the eyeball to go back into the socket. So this will be done uh, sort of in the sort of later part of the sort of disease process. Uh, does okay. that answer the question? <laughs> so how do Kalaivane, Kalaivani, I think, uh, how do we treat Kalaizion with hot comp Do How long do we treat Kalaizion with hot compression and massage before referring for surgery? Okay, uh, hot compress and massage, you know, usually if you do that for one month, you have about 50-50 chance of improving the symptoms and the conditions. So it's pretty good, right? I tell my patient, one month of hot compress massaging, 50-50, you know, I think it's a pretty good odds for um, very conservative. Sometimes if they are improving, I will encourage them to continue. I have a patient, you know, as a young child, obviously to do surgery on the child, we had to put them under general anesthetics. So that parents was keen to continue with the hot compress and massaging. So the treatment lasted for almost a year. 
before it resolves. So you can continue as long as you want, as long as it's not getting any worse. Yeah, as long as it's not getting worse, if it's improving gradually, you can drag it on for a year. You know, it will gradually improve. Generally, in my patient, I see recovery in about three months. If in three months' time, you know, they are not getting worse, uh, but they are stable, I will continue monitoring them. Most people, by three months, they are tired. They are, I'm sick of it, you know, cosmetically is no good. And then it's causing a bit of blurry vision. Um, then they will want surgery. But important thing to note is for children, you know, less than eight years of age. If they do have a little cyst pressing the eye, it is worth checking the eyesight. Sometimes the little cyst that press against the eye will induce astigmatism in their one eye. So if one eye has got astigmatism, causing a bit of blurriness, and the other eye is normal, the developing eye of a child, less than eight, eight years of age, they will favor the good eye. So the brain will say, oh, this eye is better. Let's develop this good eye and ignore this a bit blurred eye. And they will get amblyopia as a result. So for young children, you know, usually about seven or younger, the sort of preschool kids, always get their eyes checked, you know, uh, make sure they don't have uh, amblyopia in the eye. Even a simple cyst can trigger an amblyopia. So, uh, Dr. Ko asked, I think following this question is, what do you do in eye massage for style? What do I do? How to do it? Is that, um, yeah, I think how do you do it? Okay, I'll teach you how I do it. The main thing about eye massage is consistency. You know, it doesn't matter what technique, make sure you do it every single day. So, uh, that's my technique. You know, it's not found in any textbook. I have found a way of doing it because I sometimes get dry eyes, I have to do some massage. Very fast, you can do it in two minutes. So basically get a thermos flask, you know, uh, fill up with hot water and leave it overnight. You know, uh, it will cool down a little bit and pour it in that thermos flask cup. Check it with a little pinky finger, uh, fing uh, finger make sure it's not burning hot. A uh, couple of tissues inside and dip it and make a ball of wet, hot tissues. And then if your fingers can touch it comfortably, then you are okay to put it around the eyes. So close your eyes and leave it there. Within 30 seconds, it will cool down. So squeeze it all down, uh, squeeze it out, and then put it inside the hot water again and repeat it. So about four or five times. And once you're done, you know, then you gently massage it, either using a clean finger, or you can use that wet tissue pad and just massage it. But once you massage it, squeeze all the water from the tissue and gently wipe along the lashes to get rid of all the oily secretion that's coming out. So generally that's what I do. You can do it, you know, while you're brushing your teeth, you can do one eye and brush your teeth. So, you know, as long as the patient find it easy, cheap, you know, you don't have to buy a special hot pads, you know, you don't have to do laundry to clean all your uh, towels, then you can do it regularly twice a day. So I normally get them to do twice a day. Okay, can we take more questions, Ong? We yeah. have quite a few. Okay, okay. so uh, Chong asked, for patients with foreign body sensation, but nothing noted during examination, is it worthwhile to do saline irrigation? Saline, uh, unless there are some sort of dirt in the eye, I generally don't do saline irrigation um, because if you irrigate with saline, you lose all the natural tears in the eye. Our eye tear film consists of a lipid layer and you have the aqueous layer and you have the mucinous layer. So our, eye, our tears is not just uh, salt water, is, is a very delicate balance of oil, liquid, and a bit of mucus. So that three layers are important to maintain the integrity of the tear film. So a saline wash literally just wash away all the, uh, the lipids, you know, all your mucus. So I generally discourage them from using saline uh, although some people really like it, but once they start using it, they will have to keep using it because the eye just dries out. You lose all the natural oil. I would generally ask them to buy a preservative free, you know, get the preservative free uh, artificial teardrops and use that as a regular replacement. If your eye feels gritty, just put it in and you'll feel more comfort and you will preserve the natural tear film in the eye. Okay, Aisha asks, what's the difference between a sty and a chalazion? 
Um, this condition has got many, many names. Uh, uh, generally, a sty, people think, is when it's infected, we call it a sty. If it's just a cyst that is not infected, pain free, it's a chalazin. Chalazin is also called myglomin cyst. They are pretty much you know, a synonym, uh, interchangeable. I see. So generally, sty is, uh, is when it's infected. You've got pus, you've got pain, you've got some cellulitis around. Okay, uh, Dr. Ko asks if uh, in Mastinia gravis, is it necessary to operate the droopy eyelid? Is drug alone okay? Uh, generally, drug alone is sufficient. But I do see people, you know, with a combination of aging problem and also uh, made worse by the Mastinia gravis. So they do have aging sort of... Uh, related stretch in the muscles, so they get involutional changes. And then they have another myasthenia gravis. Generally, a box standard, you know, classic, uh, classic myasthenia gravis, we don't do any surgery at all. So we generally just give them medication, uh, then it will improve. Okay. So so surgery we'll is not the first line, unless you can find other reason for the droopy eyelids. So Chong asks, how to monitor thyroid eye disease? For now, in his practice, he only monitors TFT and general symptoms. What should he do? I take I use he, but it could be a she. Do for thyroid eye disease to improve my practice. So I think in a thyroid eye disease, it's uh, it's useful to check the clinical features. There are usually seven things you look for. You know the. First of all, if you ask about pain, you know, these are all scoring, you know, these are the clinical activity scores. You ask about pain. So as part of your thyroid sort of consultation, just generally ask about pain. Any pain in your eye at rest. You know? So if you say, yeah, I've got pain, then you put one point for them, score one point. And then you ask them to look left, right, up and down. If there's any pain when you look at you know, a different position, if they get pain, then you put another one, one point. So the score for pain is on red and rest and movement. The next thing is you look at the eyelids. Is the eyelid red at all? If you see the eyelid a bit red, you know, flushed, then you score them one more point. Is the eyelid swollen or not? Now, swelling of the eyelid is a bit tricky unless you see them longer term. Some people, they come in, they get a bit of uh, puffiness because of the fat prolapse with thyroid eye disease. That is not swelling. That is just a fat prolapse, giving them some puffy eyelids. So you need to see your patient over time to know what they look like. And then suddenly a bit more puffiness. Generally the puffiness is the skin gets a bit shiny, get a bit tense. That is when there's inflammatory puffiness and that will score them one point again. So eyelid redness, uh, sort of uh, puffiness, swelling, you get your one point. And then you look at the eye surface. Is the eye red? If the eye red, and if you see some jelly appearance around the conjunctiva, we call chemosis, they scare, score another point. And then obviously under the microscope, I will look at the caruncle, the really fleshy paint part inside the corner. If that's rare and fleshy, they get another point again. So all these things are useful. If you get more, if you get three points, three symptoms that is positive, then they will need steroids. So it's easy to check, you know, if you got pain and movement, they got a bit of a redness in the eye. Pretty much, they will need some steroid uh, treatment. If they get four, uh, then I will give them intravenous. Intravenous is methylprednisolone. I generally give them, depending on the size of the, the body weight, it could be half a gram, uh, 500 milligrams, uh, or maybe like 250 milligrams uh, in a pulse. Uh, I pulse them every week and with a maximum dose of eight grams. Don't go more than eight grams in a year. Uh, if you go too high, then you are at risk of causing liver damage. So you want to monitor the dosage. And important thing, apart from treatment with steroids, you make sure they don't smoke cigarettes. Cigarette will undermine your treatment. If you take steroids and if you smoke, it's like nothing being done for the patient. Oh. You will actually uh, smoking and thyroid eye disease, they are like, mm. <laughs> so always ask about smoking, even passive smoking, you know, they have to stop. 
Uh, I know it's quite gentle to say, oh, maybe you cut down your smoking. I, I don't say cut down, you completely stop the smoking. Otherwise, there's no point giving you any treatment. Uh, so smoking, I think is very important. People tend to forget. Uh, they have to stop smoking uh, immediately if they want, if they really treasure their eyes and say, you better throw away the packet. No more uh, smoking. Uh, so, so that's what I do in my clinical practice. Obviously, if you want to go in more detail, you can measure the eyelid or you just take photographs. You know, with digital technology, you just take a photograph and you can compare the serial uh, images to see how they're getting bad or getting better. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Chong. Um, okay, so Faha asked, so we refer cases for recurrence time for biopsy to rule out cancer. Is there any other criteria to consider? I don't think so, right? Okay, never mind. Uh, you, you, uh, normally, my, in my books, if you have patient who has done two calasian surgery and it comes back in the same location, so the third operation you're going to do will be a biopsy. Oh, I see. After you, you do an operation, if they recur, okay, you know, it happens sometimes, you do again. If it comes back again in the same location, the third thing you do is a biopsy. So that is my criteria to decide who the biopsy. Okay. Uh, let's, there are a lot of questions and there are some questions from Facebook. I hope you don't mind. Don't so mind. Chong, uh, Chong asked, uh, in the case of viral conjunctivitis with blurry of vision, do we try to treat with artificial tears first? Okay, conjunctivitis, if it's blurriness, um, you know, it's very important to make sure there are no cornea ulcers. So if you guys have access to fl fluorescent dye, just put it in and make sure they don't light up light green. Um, if you mainly you ask about pain as well. If you have pain, you really need to rule out corneal ulcers or even uveitis, which could you know, uh, masquerade you know, as a conjunctivitis or even a glaucoma, you want to make sure there's no glaucoma there. If the pain is not there, but a bit of blurry vision, then you can continue with artificial tears. Because when they get conjunctivitis, their eyes get dry, very dry as well, because of the irregular surface of the conjunctiva. When they blink, they get irregular moisture on the surface and they really get uh, sort of dryness. Generally, people who have conjunctivitis, you don't get profound blurry vision. It may be, you know, slightly blurry compared to a good eye, but if they are very profound blurriness, always think of something else. Could it be acute angle closure glaucoma? Could it be uh, what we call viral keratitis, like, you know, herpes keratitis? So always think about that. Uh, have the back of the mind. Usually pain is a feature of something more sinister. So I always about, ask about pain. If there's pain, I need to really see them just to rule out more nasty infection. Okay, we'll take some questions and some of them may not be from a medical doctor. Um, okay. So Wong Siu Wei from Facebook asks, is there any advice for elderly with frequent complaint of stinging eyes and excessive lacrimation? Do they need immediate medical attention? Okay, for elderly patients with excessive tearing in the eye. Now, the word elderly, I would think about other conditions. Elderly people, sometimes they get aging changes to the eyelid where the eyelid can turn in, you know, called entropy. So you want to make sure they don't have that because if you do have that, it's a perfectly curable condition. Obviously, you need operation to fix the eyelid. It will be perfectly curable. Uh, it will save them a lot of hassle with drops, multiple visits to doctors. So that one, you know, you need to make sure they haven't got that. Number two, if they get a lot of teariness, but no pain, also you know, I need to make sure they don't have blocked tear ducts. It is more common in elderly group when they get blocked tear ducts, that they always get watery eyes. And obviously dry eyes can lead to watery eyes. So it's a bit of a counter logic, you know, why we have somebody with watery eyes actually have dry eyes. Because I mentioned about the tear film, we have different layers of tear film. If you get underlying dry eyes, 
your eye actually have a reflex reaction producing more aqueous tears. It's like a natural reflex to counteract discomfort. So if you have very bad chronic dry eyes, you can present with constant teary eyes. So yes, artificial tears may help. In a, uh, you can start it first before seeing a doctor. You can maybe start for one or two weeks. If it doesn't do anything to the patient, I think it's best to get it checked out for other causes. Okay, D Divya Ramakrishnan asks, Doctor, can you explain regarding lazy eye stung? Okay, lazy eye is a general uh, sort of term that people use that can mean many things. Lazy eye, you know, a lot of people talk about lazy eye because they are trying to describe a squint in the eye, which means the eye is not looking uh, in the same alignment. Maybe the eye looking straight, but one eye seems to be looking outside or looking inwards. Some people call that lazy eye. Uh, that is in medical term called strabismus or a squint and not called, uh, not lazy eye. Lazy eye in a true sense, in a medical term, we call amblyopia. Amblyopia means the eye is normal structurally. So the um, retina is normal. The optic nerve is normal. Lens, everything is normal is the connection between the eye and the brain is to do with the, the neural connection is not normal. Now, when the child is born, the eye and the brain are working together to establish the connection. So if there's anything that blocks the eye from seeing that the signal to the brain is diminished, then the brain will selectively ignore the eye. So that eye becomes ignored the vision will become blurry, and that is what we call amblyopia. So the age in which that development happened is from birth until about age of eight years of age. So it's important to make sure that eyes, the children I can see during this yeah, critical age when the eyes developing. After the age of eight, even though you're trying to repair, you know, whatever treatment won't work anymore. So amblyopia will be pretty much permanent for the rest of their life. If it's left untreated. Okay, um, I think uh, this doctor asked, how often oral steroid causes glaucoma? Ah, okay, glaucoma, how often? Uh, if you use it long term, it depends on person as well. Some people are very, very sensitive to uh, steroid use, especially younger people, young, younger age groups. Um, if you are talk, talking about uh, people in their teenage years, children, they are very, I don't have the figure for you, but I see them quite a lot, which means uh, an eye drop of steroid within about six weeks, they will get secondary glaucoma, the pressure will go up. Uh, in their early 20s, they get it as well, and they get less and less with age. You know, by the time they hit 40s, you can use you know, uh, steroid drops or even take steroids. You're generally un very unlikely to raise the pressure too much. So it's pretty much age dependent as well. And also depends on the person. Some people are very steroid responsive. A little bit of steroid pressure goes really high, but I generally don't see many of them in a sort of elderly age group, you know, in their sort of mid fifties, sixties, seventies, you know, less often in the elderly group. Okay, we take a few, two more questions. And one is uh, Ivan asking, is myopic prone for retinal detachment? Yes, yes. Myopia, high, we're looking at high myopia. Uh, high myopia means your power of greater than five diopters, or in a colloquial term, 500. Five are diopters and above, you are classified as high myopia and your risk of detachment is higher than the general population. So the risk of retinal tear, uh, retinal detachment is higher. So anybody in that particular group, you know, if you have uh, symptoms like floaters in the vision, like black spots floating around, that happen suddenly and quite a lot, or you see flashes of light in your vision, even though you close your eye, you see the flashing lights, and you need to get your retina checked out to make sure there are no tear or detachment. Okay, Ivan Tan uh, on Facebook asks, uh, do you recommend routine vitamin A for elderly to prevent night blindness? Uh, 
um, uh, not really, unless they are vitamin deficient. Generally, vitamin A are available in the sort of uh, most of the food that we eat. Uh, vegetables, you know, you've got carotene, fruits and vegetables. Too much vitamin A will cause dry eyes. I think uh, I wouldn't use it as, as, in fact, I never actually prescribe vitamin A for my patients uh, because I, I feel that vitamin A deficiency is not common uh, in our sort of Malaysian diet. Okay. okay. We are, our diet is pretty rich, you know, we, we don't have vitamin A. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, but there are certain nutritional supplements that is helpful for the eyes, uh, especially um, if, okay, vitamin A, they are researched, suggest beta carotene, right? Not quite uh, vitamin A, beta carotene is helpful for the retina. In patients with uh, dry age macular degeneration, so if you have a severe form of macular degeneration, the dry type, by consuming certain uh, element, uh, certain types of nutrients, which consists of beta carotene, uh, some you know zinc, uh, lutein, things like that, it will reduce your risk of progression into the wet macular degeneration, and they are based on sort of randomized controlled trials. But I wouldn't give it to anybody uh, as a supplement, uh, but only as an interventional treatment. Okay, last question before we sign off. Uh, can Dr. Ong provide general advice on good eye care for patients? Okay, okay. good eye for patients. First thing, number one, you know, right now I see a lot of people with dry eyes, right? Dry eyes, they're multifactorial environment. If you are in the air conditioned room all the time, we get dry eyes. Our diet, lack of omega-3, we get dry eyes. Right now, we have a lot of people looking at digital screens, prolonged hours on digital screens. If possible, right, you know, get a bigger screen, you know. It, when you okay. look at small, small things on the phone, you know, I, you see, I, including me, I'm a guilty one. <laughs> I can watch a whole movie on a small phone. You, know, you don't have to do that. You don't have to uh, strain your eye doing that. You know, get a bigger screen. So lifestyle changes, what you watch, you know, TV, get a bigger screen, so less strain on the eye. Number two is UV protection. You know, try to avoid UV exposure to the eyes. So uh, get a nice pair of sunglasses when you go out, even driving, even though in a cloudy day, we do get a lot of UV light going through in a cloudy day. And you know, avoid smoking, eat lots of fruits and vegetables. The, uh, fruits and vegetables by far the best. Uh, I know it's easy to pop a pill, you know, fruits and vegetables contain antioxidants, vitamin C, fiber, you know, and phytonutrients that you can't get all from your pills. So a healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, and then get some sleep, you know, a lot of people don't sleep enough and they get dry eyes. Now, having talked about UV light uh, reduction, if you have children, you know, in a uh, kids, uh, maybe less than years, uh, 16 or, or younger, they need UV lights, all right? These kids need natural sunlight. So if you have young children in a family, get them out. Avoid looking at a TV screen. And if they have to study, you know, lockdown, the virtual school, whatever, uh, make sure that desk is near to, you know, an open window. And it's okay to get the sun in. Uh, and try not to get them to wear those digital glasses, UV protecting glasses, because their eyes need UV blue light to develop properly. Uh, right now, we get an epidemic of myopia in young children because of lack of natural light in their eyes. So kids and adults, they have slightly different requirements. Kids need to go outdoors, play, be exposed to two hours of sunlight every day. Okay, sorry. Uh, I keep on pressing and um, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh. Oh my God, this is all wrong already. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, this has been a very long session, mainly because it's been very interesting. Uh, we have had a lot of questions, um, and um, seriously, I really, really never. I took my eyelids for granted. I always thought the eyes is like the eyeballs. And um, I'm so sorry about that. 
So I really, really would think of eyelids these days. Uh, to Serena, she says, thank you for the presentation. Um, next lecture on ENT, please. No, we had ENT last week. Uh, we spoke about uh, sleep apnea last week. So next week we are having uh, on skin. So we're gonna have spot diagnosis. Uh, so it will be a very interactive session because we're going to show uh, spot diagnosis on skin. So yes, um, Haja says she can't scan the QR code still. Um, okay, so two things. I do not know why you can't scan the QR code. Is there anyone who can't scan the QR code? Um, you need to message me uh, your name, your MMC number, your IC number, and your email. Okay. Um, then I will send it to a FISA, who is the marketing uh, personnel in um, Beacon, and she will manually do it for you. Okay. Now, there have been a lot of people just coming in, okay, at 10 o'clock just to scan the QR code. Next time, I'm not going to admit you guys, okay? I'm doing it this, this for the last time. I'm not going to admit you guys unless you come in before 10 o'clock, at least 9.30, okay? It's just not good. Uh, so, if you can't scan... Uh, please, please um, message me again with your name, your IC and your MMC number and your email address. And I hope you guys got Dr. Ong's um, uh, phone number. Uh, I'll try to get Dr. Ong to join my tele our Telegram group chat. And again, please, everybody, join on my Telegram group chat. Okay. And then I'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks, Ong. Thank you. Thank you. It was okay. really, really, really good. I really, really enjoyed it. Amazing. Me too. A really nice platform. Thank you, everybody, for coming. All right. Good night. Okay.